Are you looking for an escape from manufactured truth wrapped in selfish agenda? Don't you just want to have a real and raw conversation, all masks and rules aside? That's what you're getting here at Titan Evolution Podcast. Get rid of all the nonsense information and discuss everything under the sun without filters. Listen to real stories of real people who will put your current perspectives to the test, guide you on living the life you truly want, and see everything free from judgment and pretenses. Time to get rid of those unhealthy environments and let your authentic self shine. Here are your hosts, Travis Johnson and Carol Carpenter. Hey, welcome back to the show. I'm here today with Shelby Joe Long. Shelby, how you doing today? I'm good. Great. Great to be on the call. I'm excited to chat. Uh, if there's one thing I love about Shelby, it's definitely <laughs> chatting. <laughs> we've we've had some epic chats in different locations. She even beamed me in to her former uh, what do you call it classroom at Rocky Mountain. Yeah, College. it was my in my organizational communication class. It, uh, it you know I seem to remember communicating and it was very organized. <laughs> All about business communication. Yeah, but you left. Brought you in because you created a business out of this. Yes, I did create a business out of chatting with people and recording it and putting it all over the place. You've got your own show, Genius Entrepreneur. Yeah, the Genius Entrepreneur podcast. Yes. I do. I also love chatting with people. So it's kind of fun. <laughs> you also have created an elite sports academy and you run She Talks magazine. Is there anything that you don't do? Uh, yeah, I don't do anything in the finance industry. I don't do anything in, uh, accounting. Um, I, the, everything I do is communication based. It's a lot of the same process. It's just in many different places with nonprofits, with women trying to enter their brand into the marketplace with providing more visibility. It's all around communication. So it's a uh, lot applies lots of different places. <laughs> it sure does. I know that I've have a a very interesting communication style, and one of the things that I really enjoy doing, one of the things that serves me really well, is I basically hold up a mirror to people. These are uh, potential clients and clients, and they can see what everyone else sees. And occasionally, it puts people into a panic. They don't realize what it is that they're putting out. They're not sure what it is. And when I reflect that form, like it induces panic attacks. Has that ever happened to you and any of your clients? Uh, yeah, I taught public speaking for a lot of years. And uh, I communications, I've always been a communicator. I was on the debate team and I taught, I spoke professionally in college and still speak professionally. And that's one of the things I tell people to do is practice your presentation in the mirror so you can see what you look like when you're presenting. What happens to people when they don't like what they see? They get really scared and they kind of shut down. Yeah. So, and it's, it's, it's hard because I mean, that's the thing about communication too, is that it's a process and it's something that is dynamic and it's constantly changing for whoever your audience is and for whoever you're talking to. I'm sure that you have, you, every podcast interview that you've had has been different and it's moved in a different way. You've talked about different things and it's because it's all very personal. And when we become more comfortable communicating, then it's a little bit easier to get into our story and develop some more charisma as we speak. And it, it takes time to develop that. So I've worked with people that are super comfortable in their jobs and what they do and in their genius zone, but speaking about it is a whole different thing because it's putting yourself on stage and then you get it then everybody gets to see it so it's a it's interesting it's very Dynamic. a very vulnerable and exposed position to be out there in front of a, a larger even even worse a small audience and when you know right. a couple people in there and you're not sure what you're doing or you lose your spot and then you realize just how exposed you are and how everyone's going to see all your private parts. And before you know it, you're <laughs> running off the stage, tears streaming. Now, at least that's what happened to me in my early days of public speaking. People are like, you speak so well. Like, how? I can't ever picture you having problems. Like, 
there was problems. There was definitely <laughs> problems. Yeah. It it takes a, you know, I was listening to a podcast earlier today. John Oliver was on it. Um, and he talked about how, you know, good that impromptu, like going up to somebody and interviewing them on the street and kind of moving just not really having a plan when they go into something and just being very impromptu, how that's something that's, that is super comfortable for him, but give him like a memorized speech to give on a stage. And that's, that's what is panic inducing for him. So I think it's different for everybody. I'm more of the, you know, my speaking, what I've done in the past, as far as my involvement with debate and professional speaking, that's put me on stage a lot, but it's also helped me harness the skills to respond very quickly and to develop charisma in my speech and to be more emotional, but it just, it just takes time. It's just like singing or shooting a basketball or, you know, uh, perfecting some sort of dance move. It takes training and it takes time and it takes trusting yourself and understanding your skills. Cause every speaker has a different charisma that makes them energetic and and attractive to an audience. And, you know, Donald Trump has a different charisma than, you know, Michelle Obama does, you know, they both have charisma. It's just a different style of it. So. Yeah. It's not a lot of people that can get hyperbole to work very well for themselves, but every now, and again, it's super fantastic and amazing when people get a hyperbole to work out for them. Yes, <laughs> it's true. And for those of you Googling hyperbole, it's that over the top <laughs> thinking, <laughs> uh, most notably in Donald Trump speeches, um, which I think uh, is yes. very interesting. You've, you've recently, yeah. are you the editor of She Talks magazine? Is that what, uh, did I read that yeah, right? I'm a contributor. So that's Julie, Julie Ducharme's magazine, but it, with the She Talks, but I'm a contributor there too. And I have my own publishing company too, Rogue Publishing where I don't do all the publishing, but I have access to all the pieces of publishing. So there's a lot of help people get their message out into the world, whether in a magazine or a book or whatever way you want to do it. And so that's that's a way that we can help to. Yeah. So yes, I, I am involved with She Talks Magazine, but it's a, as, more as a contributor. So what, what is it about you that has every facet of your life in the communication realm? It's... It's what I love to do. It's my, it's my genius. It's my jam. It's what I, it's what I like. It's uh, it's where it's it's something that has always been. It's always been a part of what I've done. It's just I've always been haven't always been comfortable. You know, it takes time to develop that. I haven't always been a professional speaker. I wasn't always a. a national champion debater, but that uh, time and practice in the community that you're in really helps you get to those different places. It's just like entrepreneurship. It's uh you got to spend time and you got to surround yourself by the right people and you have to put the time in and that can harness, that can help you harness those strengths. And I, I, the communication thing, I've always, it's always been a part of what I've done. My parents encouraged it when I was a kid. I was in I was in 4-H, you know, 4-H? Yeah, 4-H? like heart, hands, head, and the other one. Yeah, health. Health? <laughs> surprise, surprise, health is the one I leave out. <laughs> yeah. But they, I was in 4-H when I was a kid because I was a farm kid. I grew up in a farm. I grew up in a town of 3,000 people. And that's that was kind of a social thing that we did, but it was also taught a lot of responsibility, a lot of professional skills, you not only had to like take care of an animal or do a project, but you had to present about it. And that's probably where my speaking started. And I enjoyed doing that. And I enjoyed listening to other people's presentations. And then, then, you know, no formal communication study when you're in high school, but you got to take a public speaking class. And then I was in debate. And it's because it was something that I really enjoyed being a part of. And then I just continued that and continue that in my college career speaking. And I really being on the, to go down another rabbit hole, being on the debate team transformed my whole existence. Just, just being on the team, being in that community. And then I became a college professor teaching that because I was so passionate about it. But I think fundamentally, the thing that I'm passionate about with communication is that 
it's it's transformative and it's ever moving and changing and it's just it's just kind of fun and you know it, your audience hold, hold on different you, with every audience so it's all of fun for you is, um, what it's fun for you it's fun for me right i i really love being in front of people and talking but there's so many people that don't think it's fun why do oh, you yeah. think it's fun i love it i love it it's what what about it why what about it makes it fun for you i like making an impact i like making people laugh i like making people think about things i like i like the because you're not going to change people's minds necessarily, but I I like discovering, you know, enlightening an audience to what might be something different. Mm -hmm. And I like that. I like contributing in that way. And I think the debate has a lot to do with that. But also it's like, you know, you give, go back to 4-H days, you give demonstration speeches about how to groom a sheep and make it look nice for, you know, a show. And that, that, that's, that's a process you can look up in a book or, you know, now these days, look it up on a Wikipedia page and the process is there, but something that makes it unique is that the person delivering it has their own process and their own genius and their own way of presenting that. And as a speaker, I think it's important to do that. But I mean, also that comes with being a listener too, that as a speaker, you've got to listen or you don't have to, but you're a much better speaker if you understand your audience's needs and where they're at so you can match what you're saying to that audience. So it's, yeah. you know, I think it's a, it's just a fun and dynamic, ever moving, ever changing thing that is uncomfortable for probably 95% of the population. But it's something that, something that really gives me a, I just love it because it's <laughs> always different. I know I it's made, not stagnant. It's not stagnant. It's, it's always something different you hit to talk about, right? I had both of my kids go into speech yeah. and debate. One of the things that I learned growing up is that whatever job you have, it doesn't matter what the job is, if you can speak well about whatever the topic is, the people that can speak and communicate best always, always get paid more than the person that just does the job. If you can't describe and convey what it is that you're doing, like you're only at, at the base level of knowledge. If you can teach what you're doing, and then if you can teach a larger general audience about what you're doing, and then you can go speak within your niche about the thing that you're doing, that's when you start getting paid the big bucks. Is that oh, been yeah. your experience? Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's, that's something in the realm of what I teach with business communication or what I did teach. And I still do it today. I just don't do it in front of a classroom. I do it in you know, with business audience in that realm, it's, you know, with, you can have the greatest business idea in the world, but if you can't communicate what that is and what the value of that is to your clients, to anybody, then it's, it's really hard to <laughs> make any money <laughs> and to transition that knowledge. It's just, it's challenging. So I, I totally agree with you that the, the communication piece is, and that's, that's why I, that's why I got into communication in the first place, because you can make such an impact and make such a difference with your audience. And, you know, I love inspiring younger college age students, high school age students to do that. But I, I was ready to, ready to, you know, get out in the marketplace more and do it more with professionals that need the help or that they maybe don't know that they need the help, but they can be helped a lot when they open mm -hmm. themselves up to a a third party to listen to their message and to think about, is this resonating with my audience or why, why isn't my marketing working? Well, what are you perhaps you need and, to communicate yeah. it differently because that's the fundamentals of what marketing is, is that if your message and your value is not speaking to the audience that needs to be hearing your message, it's a very simple concept, but people pay thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars or don't to, or don't. you know, <laughs> to not get their product sold. So it's, it's just interesting. Was there a, a lot of people don't know a speech and debate. If, if you haven't done that, you have to learn multiple sides of an argument. 
Was there a time and what was the topic that you had to present something opposite of what you actually believed? Yeah. Uh, often I did. Uh, but the one, the one that sticks out in my mind and, and for those of you that don't know much about speech and debate, the style of debate I did is called parliamentary debate happened all, we went to debate tournaments all over the world. I was very fortunate to be on a team that did that and debated in Ireland and Greece and, and all over the U S and it was just amazing. But the really, um, the amazing thing about it too, is that you can have these incredible conversations with people from different cultures and different experiences and, you know, talking about Brexit with uh, people from Greece and, and the UK that are actually experiencing the Brexit. And then like the big migration that happened from Syria, the refugee crisis, you know, to actually talking to people that were experiencing that is way different than being on this side of the world and reading about in the papers, but actually having those conversations were really amazing and enlightening because you knew about the subject, but you learned so much more about the subject in that space. But I remember one time and one time I had this topic and when you get a topic, you have to, you're, you're given a side that you're going to debate. So you're either going to be for it or against it and you don't get to choose the side, but then you hear the motion or the, the topic, and then you have to present a case around that. And sometimes there are cases that <laughs> you don't want to, the one, the one that sticks out in my mind is I had to, I had to support an, a, a ban on abortion and whatever you feel about abortion, you can have your own personal feelings about it. I personally am more on the choice side than I am the government regulation side than the pro-life side. Uh, and I had to support the side that I didn't believe. The challenge of that was that it, it was kind of twofold. The challenge was I had to present things and arguments and actually say things that I don't necessarily believe. But then I think the piece of growth that comes out of that is that you have a true understanding of what the other audience would say about this topic or might feel about this topic. And I think that level of understanding is something that is missing in our society for one, but I think it is also something that gives you just a deeper understanding that of other people that I might disagree with you, but I can understand where you come from. So I think the empathy that comes out of that is something that's that's admirable. And I think it's also something that that would be that would be great for everybody in activity, that would be great for everybody to be a part of is to, well, how would the other side look at this? Mm -hmm. You know, and I, I think that's a really important part of business. Uh, and that you that surrounding yourself with people that are not just yes men and women that are going to agree with everything that you say, but they're you're going to surround yourself with people that are going to push you a little bit and question and make sure that you're in the right direction and maybe bringing up sides of the argument that you might not be considering. I think it's, that's a really important place to be. So oh, yeah. I think it's a life skill. And I think it's something that, that generally, especially in the day of like social media where everything is so polarized and we hear all the information, we live in a world of confirmation bias, right? Like, we uh, Facebook and LinkedIn and everything, we get things fed to us that when we like them. So it's just confirming what we believe. And we don't often see the other side of it because we just ignore it anyway. And so I think it's easy <laughs> for us in a society to be able to like and not like or swipe left or swipe right. We could do whatever we want with that information. So it's, uh, I don't know. I think it's an important thing to do. Well, I know when you get into the politics, you do things like opposition research. And when you're in sales, you get to figure out what people's objections are in order to overcome the objections to, to go ahead and make the sale. What I think is interesting, especially when you talk about something like politics, is that everybody's right. Yeah. Well, when, when, <laughs> so when you get into like when you get into you talked about abortion, right? One side says that you're killing people and killing is wrong. They're right. You would say that you would give them the choice that it's not your choice to make, and you're also right. And some people would say that it's just a clump of cells, but everything is a clump of cells, so of course they're right too. So it's mm -hmm. really hard to understand where people fall out on the spectrum and why, and it's hard to debate when everyone in theory on the debate is correct. 
the hard parts it's that come up the different worldviews and the different perspectives and the different definite it's it, a lot of it comes down to definitions and so that's uh that's, <laughs> well, that's huge, we right if, if so you we have to read, agree if, on the same definition before we can have a good debate about right. it but then I don't know, but then that I think that's why I like the movement and the dynam dynamism of entrepreneurship because you've got to be moving and shifting and adapting, and if you need to get a client or you need to talk to your customer or you need to you know switch your business plans because COVID hit and you had to shut down, whatever that is, yeah. there's a lot of dynamism in that. So well, I like I like the 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 jump you did back to entrepreneurship away from the abortion debate. So I like that. <laughs> I'll tell like, you how no, I handled no, we're that. Back, we're back over here, Travis. We can't. We're not going down that road today. I'll tell you how I handled that debate, though. Yeah. Because uh, I had to support an abortion ban, and I basically, well, myself and my teammate, we basically said, "Fine, just get it out of get it out of government altogether. Government shouldn't have any control or say what women should do with their bodies." So doesn't belong there anyway. Just ban it all, get it out of there. Let people decide on their own. So there's a the government regulation piece of it. So it's just interesting. I think the you I think can, the, the hardest funny, part can, is just yeah. how like a, a human life, like just how life altering that can be for all the people involved. Like I grew up in trailer parks and foster homes, right? You talk about a quality of life part of debate, and it's hard. It's hard to deal with. I think the the laws surrounding uh, things like adoption are endlessly complicated. And if you would, you know, support a, you know, a ban on abortion because you would choose life, then you've got to make it easier for kids to get in the hands of well-meaning and well, uh, you know, good people. But we have this enormous barrier to entry to take care of good kids. And you're like, why are we making it so hard for kids to get in good families? Right. Yeah. But that's a whole, that's a whole debate in itself. <laughs> we, and there's a lot of other things that are involved with it. it yeah. It's, it's, it's endlessly complex. And at the end of the, the, at the end of the day, it's, it's tough. Those decisions are tough for a reason because it, it, it is so complex. Um, but opposition research and overcoming objections, those are, those are super important. If you can't agree on the base of whatever it is, and you talked about definitions, if you've ever read any bill that's gone through Congress, you realize that the first however many pages are dedicated to definitions of words. And you do you find this in any large entity. You have to define how you're using the word before you just go ahead and use the word. Yep. If you talk about secure, and you're talking about the military, for instance, when you secure uh, secure a hotel. A Marine would go in there and kick down all the doors and make sure the place is empty and it's secure as where someone in the Navy would make sure all the doors and hatches are closed and that would make it secure. And for the Air Force, they would get in touch with the concierge to make sure the reservation is secure. So <laughs> that's a little slam on the Air Force there. You're not military, so you don't get that joke. But it's us making fun of the Air Force is what it is. <laughs> but you... But it's still secure and it's still with the military, but within the military, there's all these different definitions of what it means to secure a building. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, there has to, it, I would say you could have a debate about things, but you can't make, making a decision is making a decision about one thing. If you, there's not an agreed upon definitions and you're just debate. and this is a debate, the, what do they call that? The red herring, right? They can throw out any example that doesn't necessarily point to what the solution is. They There's this big sexy argument over here. No, oh, we're going to build the wall or we're going to ban immigration, whatever that is. That <laughs> argument might not connect with whatever is being talked about. So, which is, that's media, politics and media. It's like, what's sexy? What's going to be remembered? What are the hot issues in the debate? Tie it back to immigration or abortion and you know, those are like, the key words. Make immigration, that stuff going. kills me, right? There's countries all over the world that don't have a border and don't really care, and it works. There's countries all over the world that have a border, and they secure it and enforce it immensely, and it works. The only thing that doesn't work is, like, we pretend that there's not going to be refugees every year when there's refugees every single year. 
we pretend like because it's not on the news that it's not still happening. And if we pretend that we're not treating people humanely, why are we pretending that they're not going to show up, that we're not going to treat them like humans and we pretend that it's now a crisis or not a crisis? And then you got places like California that talk about it endlessly and they have a wall that's been built for years. Right. <laughs> so what? Anyway, none of it makes sense. Okay. None of it makes sense. But the, the question is always is why is it in the news now? Oh, you know, Israel's got this stuff going on. Like it hasn't changed the entire time. Like Biden is older than Israel and he pretends like it's not going on sometimes or it is going. I don't know. It's not changed, but sometimes it's in the news and sometimes it's not in the news. Everyone that's worried about Israel, they've been dealing with it every day their entire existence. Just because it's not on the news doesn't mean it stopped happening. Right. Yeah. I don't know. Can you tell I'm on uh, the pol political chain right now? It must be an election yeah. year. It must be an election year. <laughs> and I don't even watch the news. And I know all sides of every argument because they never change. It's true. Just some nuance in it. But it's it's, you know, it's just, it's fun to learn about all those different perspectives and I think it, it makes you a better work better with people. I think you communicate, you're able to communicate with different audiences. Mm -hmm. You know, I think it just, it just helps you. I mean, this is not debate. This is just like critical thinking and understanding and, you know, connecting just, with audience. This is just human stuff. Like, 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 like you and I probably disagree on many different points of the political spectrum. You know what I do not give a shit about? Your political views. It's not going to change the fact that we are friends. How you feel on a topic is not going to change the way I feel about you. But so do you many think people, that's been, do you, do you think that's common? Uh no. I think it's very uncommon. And I don't I don't get it. I don't understand why an opinion about one topic can completely end a friendship or a relationship. I don't get it. I saw it really happen during the COVID shut down and all that and the masks and vaccinations. And I think that kind of hit us. I feel like it hit us all in the face and we didn't, because it was something we hadn't seen before and nobody really knew how to deal with it. And then we had, well, it's then the we had first to time the U S took action with every other country. Yeah. The yep. U S hadn't been taking action. They like, uh, like Zika and West Nile virus and avian flu and pig flu and all these stuff, the U.S. pretty much didn't take action. Some of the major cities kind of did, but really it was up to individual states to decide. And this was yeah. the first time the world collectively took action against a virus. The biggest mistake, in my opinion, is the fact that when they came out, was it Fauci? He should have been like, look, We've not done this before, and we're going to fuck it up. But every decision we make, we're going to fuck it up for the first 50 decisions. That's like the only mistake, in my opinion, that they made. Because as they get new information, everything is going to change. And some people took changing information as somehow not valid. Yeah. They're like, oh, you can't argue with science. Remind me, are eggs good for me or bad for me? I can never tell. Like, well, the science never changes. Like, yeah, but your opinion about science does change. And we still haven't decided if or if not cholesterol is good or bad for you. Fun fact, people on the cholesterol bandwagon, most centenarians have terrible cholesterol, but somehow they made it over 100 years. Go ahead and sleep on that one. See how that one makes you feel. <laughs> Got low cholesterol? Congrats on that making it to 100. <laughs> see, you didn't know that one, did you? I did not know that one. Yeah. We, we like to, to think advice is coming from a good place, and it is, but it's often incomplete or misleading. Like, don't play in the street. You'll get hit. You still have to teach people how to be safe around traffic. Just saying you can't play in the street doesn't mean anything. But when they actually right. teach you how to play in the street, to use that space for a, I don't know, a kickball game and to watch out for traffic and to get off the street when cars do approach, that's valuable and useful information saying get out of the street although well-meaning is not very useful so true but what the hell do i know just some guy sitting in my back room chatting on zoom with my friend shelby here 
<laughs> hey, tell us a little bit about uh, Rogue Publishing. I don't even know that I knew you had a publishing company. Yeah, it's it's an independent publishing company. There's four of us owners and we all have different businesses. I work in the business development space around ideas. And then, so I have really nothing to do with publishing, but I do have everything to do with the developing the brand around a book and introducing that to an audience and that type of thing. Then we have um, that we have a publisher who's actually involved. We have a book designer, we have an edit book editor, and we have a copywriter that are involved. And we help people independently publish their book. It's essentially what we do. It's a it's a tough, you know, I I believe you are self-published and I am self-published as well, but I did it with some help because there's quite a few things to navigate and you know, I don't, I'm not really adept at like making my book into an ebook. And so I didn't want to spend the time doing that. So I went to <laughs> I just a, pay someone on Fiverr five bucks to do it for me. <laughs> I should have done that, but, but well, a nice what... company came out of it. And so yeah. now we have a whole company out of it, which is kind of fun. Well, one thing you did say in there was marketing. And I think that is probably between marketing and giveaways, I think those are the two biggest areas really impacting how good a publishing house is or is not. Is it, Can you get books sold? And most of the people that have a business surrounding their book are discovering that the more books they give away, the more money they actually earn. Give away about a thousand books and you're going to earn a million dollars in business. So just having a book really isn't that impactful because how often are you going to have more than 1,000 sales, let alone 100 sales of a book? Right. Well, and you don't make money on your book. But then you have, there's a whole business strategy and a brand strategy behind it too, is that what's what's the offer? <laughs> you know, What do you have to offer your the people that do read your book? Is it a coaching program? Is it a membership community? Are there other things attached to it? And I I feel like this is not exclusive to, this is not one author or, but I feel the majority of them are thinking about the book and not really what's on the other side of it. Thinking because, of the ecosystem surrounding the book. The book is just one piece of it. And if that's what you put all of your eggs into, you're going to find out that you're going to go broke. And it's a big, it's a nice credibility piece. It's really nice to have that. And it's a nice, it's a nice, it helps build your authority, but you got to use that authority to make a bigger impact. I'm all about making a big impact and uh, and making the biggest impact you can with your ideas. So that's what I help people do. Well, isn't that the the same thing with with actually doing a podcast? Is people like Travis? You keep pushing this podcast piece, but I've done all these interviews and and nothing came from it. How did you use the asset that was created? Did you break it down? into video clips have you been pushing those on social media yeah i posted it on social media once bro your 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 stuff online only lives for like six seconds in most places right. you can publish and republish stuff on tiktok even if you did one interview in theory you could publish and republish that stuff every single day until it hits and takes Absolutely. off your stuff's not living online did you take your content and did you go out and did you write a PR piece and publish it on like PR Newswire and hit, you know, get yourself some couple of articles in the news. Did you take those articles in the news and use it to land a bigger interview on, I don't know, a TV station or something like that? Did you use it to write a LinkedIn article or to write on Medium? No. You just did an interview and did nothing? Well, no wonder it didn't work for you. Got to use it. You got to like use book. it. Mm -hmm. You got to use it. It's not having the thing. It's how you leverage the thing. If you're watching right now and you're looking at the videos, you can see that I have some degrees on the wall, like these pieces of paper somehow make me special. Or you can see the fact that I've got, uh, oh, what is this? We got the Veteran Podcast Awards. Winning a Veteran Podcast Award was amazing. Being part of the process, being a host for them is, is all good and well. But if I never use that fact in any of the conversations that I have, well, Travis, that's self-promotion. Yeah, but if I don't promote myself, ain't no one else going to do it for me. Who else is going to do it? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I could walk around and I can introduce Shelby everywhere we go. And it would be amazing for Shelby and she wouldn't have to do any of the talking. But if I'm not there, Shelby just might have to talk about herself. 
you know, just a little bit, right? Yeah. <laughs> I think that's challenging for people too. I, I work with people in developing their brand story and talking and being like your brand story comes from your most vulnerable point when you either had a failure or you were at rock bottom. And that's what people want to hear is the journey. And, and I feel like many entrepreneurs, including myself, it took me a long time to dig into my story, but I feel that that is something that, you know, I've been speaking a lot of my life, but you know, you're not used to talking about yourself or talking about these challenges or overcoming challenges. And that when that happened, I feel like the floodgates were open and it gave me an even better version of myself to talk about. Well, we actually, we haven't talked about that here. You and I have talked about it before uh, on several occasions, but we haven't talked about it in your interview, talking about your traumatic brain injury. And how old were you when that happened? Remind me. Yeah, it was the end of my junior year of high school. So I was 17 and I was, it happened the night before I went to, I was in a car wreck and I grew up in a small town, 3000 people. I lived on a farm 10 miles outside of town. I was driving into town for class night, which is the award before graduation. Sorry, my son was just there. That's okay. And, uh, You're allowed to have kids. <laughs> allowed to have to talk to my kids when they get home. And I was driving into town and I was hit broadside by a much larger truck that was going very fast down a gravel road. And I was thrown into a coma. Very awful. I don't remember the accident. I don't remember. I lost, I had amnesia about the month before the accident. And then I don't remember much about being in the hospital after that, but I was in a coma for 16 days mm -hmm. and I was in uh, the rehab center for about four weeks after that. And I, I remember very little about the rehab center. I remember some things, but that, and I still, to this day, that was, gosh, that was 30 years ago in Mar or in uh, end of May when that happened. It's crazy. That's been 30 years, mm -hmm. but I was that, yeah, that was a setback, but I, it was also something that I, you know, it changes who you are, right? It, it I, totally I, I, I wanted are. to say something real quickly uh, for those yeah. that aren't familiar with TBI. It's not like a concussion, right? It it is it it changes your actual brain chemistry and you become a different person. So that first 17 years of who you were, some of those qualities were, remained, but you become a different person after a TBI. I think that was probably the most challenging thing. And when it happened. Uh, you know, I'll finish the story about when that happened, but it was like, I think that's one of the most challenging things because I was, it was the end of my junior year. I was just elected senior class president. I don't remember that by the way. And I just got elected to go to girl state. I just returned from the state debate tournament, third place. I don't remember any of those things. I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to laugh at you, but I just heard a joke that we should tell both Biden and Trump that they won so they can just be <laughs> done with it. And so done. when you say he didn't remember you winning, I was like, that's <laughs> like a joke I just heard. <laughs> right. Maybe they won't. Maybe they, they have that amnesia. Yeah, it's just funny. Like all those, I was kind of at the top of my game. I was, I was a 4.0 student. I was ready to get ready to go to college the following year. You know, I had a senior year and go to college after that. And, and I think the, you know, that's why where it kind of gets back to communication. So after the coma and after the four weeks in the rehab center, I went home and I was very, very fortunate to be able to go back to school my senior year. And I went back to all of the things that I did before. I was on the debate team. I was in youth legislature. I was in calculus class. I was in AP biology or whatever. And I did all those things because that's what I that's what I did. And that's what I knew. And my dad was a big, important part of that too. Cause they, he was like, well, we're not going to give her a reduce. They, we had this meeting before school. I remember this distinctly. And he said, well, we're sure as hell not putting her in lower classes. She's got to be challenged. She's going to college next year and that's what she wants to do. And we're going to make sure she does it. And so there was that, I wasn't even allowed to like be the victim. You know what I mean? 
<laughs> and I think that was the that was the best thing for me. And I think mm -hmm. that's the other kind of magic about it too. Again, I was so, so fortunate that I actually came out of the coma and that I actually had the opportunity to recover. Um, and my brain injury was closed. It was a closed brain injury. I had no abrasions, but I kind of bruised my brain and just kind of reset everything. Um, my left side was paralyzed and I had, so I had to relearn how to walk and I had to relearn how to write and I had to relearn how to do all those things. And very, very fortunately it came back. So I was able to go back to school, but that was the big push that my dad was like, hell no, she's going to do it all. And she's going to go to college. But it was never a question in my mind of whether I was, I was like, of course I go into debate. Why wouldn't I, why mm -hmm. wouldn't I do this? But that, I don't remember the trauma. And I think that might be something that, that helped me through that because I just went and did everything I did before. And it's, I it's, went out to it's, college that following year. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I say it, it's, it's one thing to, to have a inciting incident like that and see what the follow is. And it's, it's a whole other thing to not remember what happened. You know, I recently got on a car wreck and it's had an impact on my life. And the big difference between your story and my story is I remember every thing that happened, maybe not in the right order, right? Maybe time's not quite yeah. so right in my memory, but I remember it happening. And so now I'm left thinking like, if I was able to, to do something as crazy as that, you know, am I that person now? Is there, you know, it is shaking the confidence within me to know what kind of person I am. And even though that I can speak very eloquently and I sound very confident in everything I do on the inside, I'm like, I don't even know what I'm doing with my life right now. Yeah. It's, it's frightening. And I think, you know, what, what I can draw to with that, like, I didn't want anybody to know that I was the kid with the head injury or the kid that was in the car wreck. So like when I went to college, I didn't tell anybody about it. And I think I just, I hit it. Like I wanted to be the kid that was not in the car wreck. I wanted to be the kid that was in high school and having a great time and going to be a senior and going to go to college the following year. I didn't want to be the kid that was recovering. And so I hit that for a long time. And it wasn't until I wrote the book which was three years ago now where I really started to dig in and discover what those stories are and, and to really tap into the emotion around it because it was trauma mm -hmm. much like similar to what you experienced. And it was just, I finally dealt with the trauma, but I dealt with it in a really bizarre, weird way because I had to talk to my family and my friends and my weird. So, well, that too, but it's, uh, but I don't remember, I don't have any emotion around it because I don't remember it. And so I, I went back, you know, my, I tell this story all the time. My best friend, Jill, uh, she, <laughs> she called me every single day after I woke up from the coma every day. And I bet you, I had, I bet you I was on the phone with her for hours and hours. And I had the same conversations with her over and over and over again. And bless her heart. She just listened to me and, and was like, I know, you know, and it, it got better over time, but like that short-term memory was affected. So I would have, and not a whole lot was happening because I was in the hospital. And so it was, you know, having those conversations over and over again. And sounds I terrible. Didn't, I didn't realize. It sounds that. absolutely terrible. What's her name? Jill. Jill. My Do best you, friend. You send her like a care package every year. <laughs> I do. We're still friends to this day. You know, we were, we were good friends. Her and Jen and I have been best friends since kindergarten and they were by my side when I, when I got in the wreck and in the recovery, Jen, Jen was my debate partner my senior year and we were all on the student council together. So there was that kind of tight knit piece, but I had put, I had shut down a lot of that. I didn't want to talk about it. I didn't want to I didn't want to be vulnerable about it. And I think that was a, that was something I never wanted to do until I realized what the power of the story holds because it, it's because tough. it is a, it is a recovery story. It's a resilient story. It's a, it's, I was very fortunate, but I also worked really hard and, 
Yeah. It's not like I, I don't, I don't shy away from hard work. You know, I went to college and I didn't realize this at the time, but I really do think that being on the debate team in college, we talked about the value of debate and how important mm-hmm. that is. I really, this is very unscientific, but I really do contribute the recovery, recovery, however recovered I am from the accident, but you're a different person when you have a traumatic brain injury. You, you are, I don't know but... if I'm going to recover and be that. And that's the interesting question too. Would I be the person now if I, that I am now, if I wouldn't have had the head injury? So no, which no, no, awesome. it's the speech and debate forces you to learn stuff and look at it in a different way. And it helps you really understand what it is that you're thinking, your thought process and why and why it matters. But, you know, the dedication to that practice we find that people with ADHD, people with dyslexia, people that have TBI, people that have some kind of learning disorder, they all become these amazing people because they had to figure out how to make it through the basics, right? Going through high school or going through college Absolutely. and how to get through that stuff with their particular hangup, whatever that thing is. And, and as that's far as- you know, that's what I feel that debate did for me. Cause you know, you're in a debate round, you're listening to a speaker, you're writing down their points and then you're writing your speech and then you're thinking about how you're going to respond. And then you have to get up and give a seven minute speech after that and make it sound articulate and not say, um, you know, it's like, you have to do all these things and it's just this kind of Oliver would love that. Questions. And what'd you say? John Oliver would love that. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. I think that's, that's what I loved about it. Cause it was always moving, but I really think that got all the, I, I do, I just feel that the cobwebs kind of went away a lot faster because of that. Cause there's mm. all these, all these synapses are all firing at different times. And it's the like active exercise of critical thinking and making those leaps and jumps and responding to something like they stand up and ask questions and you have to have an answer and you have to sound good while you, you have to respond so. confidently, regardless of how you feel <laughs> on the inside. The, exactly. the other, other part about sharing your story is you're not sure how it's going to be received. I've been on stages where I've shared my story and people are crying and they're like, how could you even, you know, be standing upright right now? They're like I would be in a ball crying somewhere, you know, just, just hating all of my life. I've had people come up to me and be like, you know, if you want to play the victim, go ahead and play the victim, right? You can come up here whining about your life and, ooh, you had it so rough. And you never quite know how it's going to be received. And if you have the fortitude to ask questions and form ahead, like, no, you, you don't understand. I'm, I'm past all of these things. I didn't bring them up to say, woe is me and, and this and that. Is there's another phrase that I could have used for you to understand that before I talked about those things? I had uh, in Toastmasters, I had a response like, why would you talk so poorly about yourself? I'm like, no, no, you don't understand. Like that is, those things are are who I am today. They help make and shape who I am, but none of those things are hurting me. So I had to figure out what words I could use to make sure that the audience understood. I'm going to talk about some hard things, but they're not, they're not getting me anymore. You know what I mean? It's always so interesting to see and grow through, especially sharing your own story, which is some of the hardest stuff to do, regardless if you have a TBI or not. Well, and I think, I think that's an important, really important point that you brought up too. think about it's, it's how do you, you know, your story is tremendous and what you've overcome and the resilience that you have is tremendous. And I'm sure people would say that about me, but it's like, how do I take that? How do I, take that story and make it relatable to an audience that hasn't experienced something like that. And, and, you know, you, what you just said makes, helps make that more relatable and translate it. And you're like, I'm not telling it for sympathy. I'm telling it to, you know, to connect and Mm -hmm. to say, Hey, we all have things going on. Let's, and being vulnerable helps create that honest connection with people. And I, and it took me a long time to come to that realization. And I feel better about it now that I it has become a part of my keynote speeches and it's become a part of my brand. And, you know, because I really feel that me connecting with my internal genius 
and being in my genius zone where I'm in a space where I am taking in all that we have and all the assets you have and all the things that you put out and all the messages that you have and creating a message that can really connect with the audience you want to connect with. That's, that's the magic that I offer the world. And that's the magic that helped bring me through the accident. So. And that's what makes you a Titan. That's what makes me a Titan. Yeah. I didn't even have to ask. It just came out naturally. (laughs) I didn't mean for that to happen. But that, I think that truly happens when whatever you've been through, childhood trauma, car wreck, maybe whatever, maybe you have a career change, maybe you have a family change, you know, that trauma is, it's real and it's hard, it's challenging to get through, but what it can do on the other side of it and actually telling that story can inspire somebody else to also be resilient in those tough times. So you, that's a yeah. I, I gotta gift. say, I gotta say that nobody has a problem with change, but man, those transitions between where you are and where you're going, those transitions can be killer. They really they can. can. They really can. I I retired from the Navy two years ago, and mm-hmm. I often question, did I make the right decision? Am I making the money I want to make? Am I the person that I want to be? Am I spending time? with the right people like Shelby. And of course, right now I am, you know, making yeah. a great decision with my time. But as soon as this thing hangs up and we're done with the episode and I'm back in the reality world where I'm not, uh, you know, some award-winning podcast host, I'm just Travis or dad or hubby. Do I still like who I see in the mirror every day? Do I still like the choices that I've made? Am I the person that I want to be? Big identity questions. Yeah, super big identity questions. As we're getting ready to wrap up, Shelby, I got a couple of questions for you. One is what advice you would have to anyone that's struggling right now. And the other one is where's the one place you want people to connect with you? Yes. Uh, if you are struggling with something right now, whether it be career or anything related, I'd say two things. The don't be afraid to to ask for help. Uh, whether it's if you're transitioning your career, I have recently transitioned into full entrepreneurship. You know, you and I met when I was kind of wrapping up my time as a college professor that I've been for 18 years. And now I'm not doing that anymore. And that's a big identity question. I am a fucking amazing teacher. I'm really good. And I love being in front of an audience and I love being, I love inspiring people to think differently about things and teaching is a place where I can do that every day. And Mm -hmm. now I'm not doing that. And that's a challenge. And the way that I did navigate that and discover the confidence, not really discover the confidence, but discover the tools to do that was by surrounding myself with other entrepreneurs, other business owners that have taken that leap. So I, so people have, people are where you are now. And it's, and I would say that it's important to seek that out. That doesn't mean talk to me because I can help you put together a business. It just means talk to somebody (laughs) about it. Right. Find find a community that you want to grow into. And the community is key too. You don't have to do it alone. There are people out there that can mentor you, but also like, you don't have to do your accounting. You don't have to do your ebook transition. You don't have to do, I mean, you don't have to do podcasts if you don't want to, but there are people out there that can do it for you. You have to so, do a podcast. That's... Yeah, I think you should do a podcast <laughs> because ideas are awesome and it's really fun to do that. But it's, uh, you know, you don't have to do it alone. And that has to do with business mentorship. And that also has to do with like, you can live in your genius zone. You can. You just have to figure out ways to make all the other stuff happen. And that's easy. So, but once you kind of understand that, I think that makes the transition a little easier and, you know, joining, joining, joining clubs and joining, you know, like we met in a similar business networking thing, but it's not the network. It's how you use the network and it's how you not use the network, but it's how you leverage those relationships and build those relationships and, 
you're in it for the long game. It's not the short transactional game that we're in. It's the, it's, it's the long game. And I think that's understanding that is really key. So that's, that's my 12 piece of, uh, pieces of advice for that. <laughs> 12 pieces of it. And where can people connect with you, Shelby? LinkedIn. I'm very active on LinkedIn or Facebook. Uh, Shelby Joe Long dot com is my website uh, my podcast is the genius that's entrepreneur podcast only one only one place shelby that's four places people are gonna get <laughs> confused shelby joe that's where you're gonna go connect with shelby and from there i imagine she has links to mm-hmm. all of her fun stuff shelby thanks so much for being our guest today and i uh, really don't want to wait you, you you made me we, we tried to schedule this like 16 times and shelby was just dodging me and uh <laughs> well I, I really don't know why why she's so scared. You're uh you're not allowed to be the victim. Thanks so much for being my guest, I wasn't. Shelby. Thanks for having me, Travis. That's all for this episode of Titan Evolution Podcast. We hope this no holds barred conversation opened your eyes on what it takes to live a genuinely happy life according to your own terms. Now that you've treated yourself to such a refreshing discussion, you cannot listen to nonsense content anymore. Be sure not to miss an episode by subscribing to the show at TitanEvolutionPodcast.com. Don't forget to share the word so more people can be enlightened, informed, and entertained. Thank you for listening.